All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Thank you so much for uh, for coming out, and or I guess coming in or logging on uh, to our conversation tonight. This is uh, Beverages Weekly Meeting of the Minds panel discussion about spirits. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about American Single Malt and what what it is. Why is uh, why is American Single Malt booming as a category? And most importantly, what does it look like going forward? And what are uh, what do we mean when we talk about the uh, Tax and Trade Bureau actually putting in uh, rules and uh, and and kind of defining what American Single Malt is? And uh, this is really exciting. This is a category that I've been following for a long time as a journalist. Um, I should stop and say that mine. In case uh, uh, people want to know, my name is Clay Risen. I'm a journalist, uh, reporter with the New York Times, where I write about whiskey and, and other spirits. I'm also the author of, uh, most recently, a book came out last month, Bourbon, uh, The Story of Kentucky Whiskey, which you can check out uh, if you'd like. And uh, But we're not talking about bourbon tonight. We're talking about uh, single malt. And as I was saying, this is... Uh, a category I've been watching for uh, for a year or for a decade or so now. And, you know, 10 years ago when I first started writing about it, you can probably count the number of distilleries that were really making American single malt on one hand, uh, the ones that were really serious about it. And, uh, you know, these days, well, you need a lot more hands to uh, to count how many are are engaged in the category, how many are innovating in the category. And to talk about it, we're we're lucky enough to have two two of those uh, really original distilleries represented, and two figures who have been absolutely seminal in the development and the articulation of what American single malt is. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Tom Mooney, who will be joining us right now, and uh, Tom is. Uh, Tom is the uh, founder and CEO and head honcho at Westward Whiskey. Uh, they are in uh, Portland and just a fantastic whiskey brand that, uh, like I said, has been around, seems like since the dawn of time, which is actually not that long ago when we talk about craft whiskey. But, uh, you know, he has been an, uh, a central figure in not just the emergence of American single malt as a category, but of uh, craft spirits generally. He was the founding president of the American Craft Spirits Association, which is the leading uh, advocacy group and, and membership group for craft distillers in the United States. And he has continued to be an advocate for, for the category of craft spirits and and for the uh, the style of American single malt as, as we've come to understand it. Joining us on this virtual stage uh, is Steve Hawley, uh, who is uh, from Westland. Uh, so we got Westward and Westland uh, in Seattle. Uh, Westland and, and Steve, they are they are uh, two more uh, sort of original doers and makers in this category. Um, Steve comes to the industry from uh, from an advertising background and is now uh, vice president for global marketing. For the industry, for, for the distillery, and like Tom has really sort of cut a path uh, over the last decade, really articulating, shaping what this category is, what we talk about, what we mean when we talk about American single malt. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for being here. And just one more note to the audience as we uh, as we get going. Uh, for those who are not familiar with this platform. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you have questions, uh, you can add them uh, in the chat box on the right. And when we're done talking, we'll we'll leave room time for questions. You can upvote individual questions uh, if you see things that you agree with or you want to hear answers to. And those will be the ones that we tackle first. So uh, please sit back and enjoy. And um, we'll, uh, we'll try to get to the bottom of, of this American single malt thing. Uh, so yeah, so gentlemen, thank you, thank you very much for being here. Um, it's Thanks, Clay. Good to be here. Thanks, Clay. Thanks for the kind words yeah. and the introduction. Oh, my my pleasure. Uh, you know, I wanted to start with uh, you know, kind of sort of a really basic question, which is, you know, you live in the United States, your distilleries in the United States. We're supposed to be making bourbon, guys. I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, 
you know, what when you when you started thinking about what whiskey or or when your distillery started thinking about well, what whiskey should we be making, what was the thinking that went into you know let's make a single malt and and how did you start to think about articulating an American single malt because I think that you know the 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 that that predicate. Uh, you know, it's really important. It's it's not just single malt. Uh, it's American single malt. And is that something more than just a geographic denomination? Is that something that has uh, some uniqueness to it? Um, you know, uh, Steve, do you want to start with this? Why don't you take it and then we'll hear yeah. from Tom. Sure. I, I think you're going to hear kind of similar perspectives from both Tom and, and myself. I think that you know, we're both here in the Pacific Northwest, Tom down in Portland, me up here in Seattle. Um, we're about as far from Kentucky as you can get. Um, if you look around here, you will find the odd acre of corn, but corn does not really grow very well up here in the Pacific Northwest. What does grow quite well uh, is barley. Uh, our climate is really well suited to the, the cultivation of barley. Um, the majority of barley in this country comes from this region. It's one of the best growing regions in the world uh, for barley. Uh, better than Scotland, I would argue. So, um, you know, it just felt natural for us. You know, personally, for, for me and the team here at Weston, we had a passion for single malt. Um, bourbon didn't really seem authentic to us here. Um, so while, while the grain economy is a global one and, and you can get corn shipped to any distillery, uh, on all corners of the earth uh, and the same for barley. It just seemed natural for us to kind of pursue that here. So that's really where it all started for us. Again, around the same time as Tom and, and Westward, you know, we are about 11 years old now. Um, so we've been doing it uh, for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I, I'll uh, support that statement. Uh, yeah, whiskey more than most spirits has has a very strong sense of place and and that sense of place naturally begins with what grows you know, in the place where you make whiskey. So uh, anybody who's driven across the Northwest and you know, in particular, if you get a little bit away from the coast, I mean, it is just fields and fields of golden barley. And, uh, and to us, in addition to, to grain being local, uh, Oregon is one of the world's great beer cultures. And I mean, same applies to Seattle and Washington, right? And so we, as we thought about, you know, what Oregon whiskey is, um, naturally barley was the grain and naturally to us, a process that was very much rooted in that, that brewing culture was, was important as well. Uh, so bourbon, like Steve said, would have never made sense that Bourbon happened because it's exactly the right thing to do where bourbon grew up. Uh, single malt makes all the sense in the world for the place where we make whiskey. All right. Now, Im implicit, and actually, Tom, you sort of explicitly hinted, uh, uh, walked up to this, but uh, so running a thread running through both your answers is this notion of, you know, on some level, what we need a different word for this, but for lack of a better one, a terroir, uh, a an identity, a regional identity that that is not just what you put on your labels, but actually comes through in the spirit. You know, is there something is there something about single malt, about malted barley based distillate, you know, you, that you age? Is there something about that, that that lends itself to these kinds of conversations? Apart from being just uh, you know, kind of a, a you know, uh, uh, you know, greenfield sort of, you know, you don't have to deal with the weight of bourbon, you're making something totally new, so you can define it however you want. But is there something about single malt uh, that that allows this kind of expression of regionality uh, that maybe is different from other other whiskey types? Yeah, I would say if you don't mind me going first, I mean, we, we definitely weren't, the goal wasn't to avoid bourbon. I, I, we love bourbon as much as the next person who loves whiskey. It it was it was to really express the place you know, we're from, and and I think, but it, it wasn't to go try to be as weird as we could be because God knows you know there are plenty of grains that are not traditional. Uh, if anything, by by deciding to make Westward a single malt, we chose something you know in in the long arc of whiskey history 
much more traditional than than most of the whiskey made in the U.S. But but we feel that that malt whiskey is is elegant and it's complex and it's wonderful and it's you know to a lot of the world the highest expression of whiskey. Again, I'm not picking sides, but uh, you know, the world. I'll pick, side. I'll pick side for you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I kind of was. I, I, I needed some backup. Uh, <laughs> and so, to most of the world, whiskey and malt whiskey are synonymous. And uh, and so, to us, you know, we we just love what we can do with you know locally grown barley and locally malted barley, and you know that respect for that brewing tradition. And it's just in in putting some of the most traditional parts of whiskey making together with things that are entirely new, uh, you know, we we came up with something that is unique. Yeah, I think Clay, your your question whether intentional or not is pretty damn nuanced. Um, you know, there's you know to Tom's point, there's a big difference in my mind between barley and corn just as a as a base ingredient for whiskey. Um, it is much more nuanced, as Tom was mentioning. It's got much more kind of breadth of flavor um, that can be drawn out from, from the grain. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people say in whiskey, you know, 70, 80% of the flavor comes from the barrel. Um, first and foremost, I reject that categorically. That's a choice, not an absolute, um, no matter what type of whiskey you're making. Um, but certainly in the world of bourbon, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, bourbon is a uh, a more, I would say, one-dimensional from a flavor standpoint. It's certainly more oily. It's it it needs that kind of that oak to stand up and and meet it. Um, barley is different. Uh, barley again is much more nuanced, much more complex. I think you can draw out. Again, what word we want to choose is 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 up to everyone. Whether it's terroir or provenance, we like to say sense of place because we think that encapsulates it more holistically. But I think it's easier to do so with barley than it is with some other grains. And that's what's fascinating to us and compelling to us about single malt whiskey. Also kind of in your question was, are there regional nuances even within single malt? That's a question we get at the commission uh, quite a bit is, will these kind of regional styles emerge just like has happened in, in Scotland? Um, that's a source of debate even with our, within our own group um, because, you know, whiskey and the grain economy globally has become so commoditized. You know, I, I always roll my eyes at the, at the Scottish regions because, I mean, honestly, guys, it's a little bit of bullshit, isn't it, right? It's like they talk about their water, but they're all getting their grain from the same place. They're all using the exact same yeast. Their barley is often coming from Poland or Eastern Europe, not, not even in their backyard. So the lines that they've drawn from a regional standpoint where they were kind of genuine in the early days have become more of a marketing thing. And I, I personally am a little wary of that happening here. I don't want to force regions on American single malts. Um, but I think, you know, you're talking to two people that, that are inspired and influenced by certain things that are around us. And I think that beer culture that Tom was talking about, I think that's certainly you could argue there's kind of a Pacific Northwest style emerging naturally. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I mean, the United States, I, I love talking to customers in Europe because Tom's right. You say whiskey, they think single malt unless you tell them differently. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they sometimes don't really have a, a firm grasp of how big the United States is. You know, Scotland is, could probably fit inside of Washington. Don't quote me on that. I'm sure I'm, I got my geography wrong, but. Um, it's a small place and, you know, America is a big place and it's diverse, you know, incredibly diverse from a climate standpoint, from a grain standpoint and whatnot. So, um, it should be interesting to see if that stuff emerges or not. Yeah. And if I can yeah. interject, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I agree hundred percent with Steve that, that the differences are less about geography, like the real differences in these products and more about the decisions, the, you know, the choices that whiskey makers make. And so you, you might think from the amount that Steve and I agree with each other that our whiskeys taste the same, they couldn't be more different from each other, right? And they're both you know, amazing products that are born of all of these wonderful you know, grains and culture of the Northwest. 
but they're still really different. And and so I, you know, as you know, with Westland as one of the, the co-founders of the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission, we're really excited about the way, you know, we're all collectively proposing to define this because there is so much room for innovation, for differentiation, for style, for preferences. Like you, if we can make whiskey just down the road from each other that is completely different and yet still all within you know, that definition of what it is we're doing. Yeah, that's what's magical about malt, you know, just at a base level. And, the, and what I like about single malt globally, even going back to Scotland, and I said, you know, they, they all have similar equipment. They use the same yeast. They're getting barley from the same place. And yet they're creating vastly different flavor profiles from distillery to distillery to distillery. I'm not so sure that that is even possible if every bourbon distiller in America threw tradition out the window. I'm not sure that they could create that kind of variation uh, to the degree that we can with malted barley. I just think it's mm -hmm. it's the nature of the grain. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. And, bef and before we get to kind of the present, what I, I, I was because both of you have have been around for so long, uh, relatively speaking, <laughs> uh, yes, in old, whiskey, in, in craft whiskey years, let's say, uh, do that conversion. Um, what what have you what has been kind of the trajectory for single malt? I mean, again, you know, when I was sort of first, you know, really aware of the category or really just sort of, you know, watching it 10, 12 years ago, you guys, four or five others, I mean, there weren't that many people who were making it seriously. Uh, you know, McCarthy, uh, you know, he was doing it, uh, a few others. Obviously, today it's very different. And so aside from just the sheer size of the sheer number of people making American single malt, how has, what are some of the changes, the kind of contours uh, that you've seen emerge over the last 10 years from, so how does it look different today from the way it looked, you know, a decade ago? Well, I think, I mean, first and foremost, people are calling it American single malt. You know, if you looked at some of the early uh, distillers, you mentioned McCarthy's, uh, you've got uh, Stranahan's is in there out of Colorado, you've got St. George down in Alameda, California. Um, you know, Stranahan's was Rocky Mountain whiskey, I think. Uh, it's yeah. gone through a few iterations. I'm not sure even McCarthy's said single malt, certainly didn't say American single malt on it. So I think just the nomenclature has has taken root, which is a good thing and an important thing. Um, but yeah, you're right. There was a handful. Um, and then when Tom and us started, there was maybe 10 or a dozen. Uh, when we first got together in 2016 in Chicago to form the commission, there were nine of us. Um, now our membership is over 90. And I know personally 200 different distillers that are making single malt in this country. So I think it's just kind of I think it's taken off from a production standpoint. And I think one of the big changes that I've seen is that you have distillers, almost regardless of size, small, medium, large. Um, I think, you know, Westland was in 2016, one of a handful that were dedicated exclusively to single malt. You know, those nine, Tom included, um, those nine that were, that were early founders of the commission, not even all nine of them were dedicated exclusively to single malt. So I think that what we're seeing is that more and more people are being able to pay the bills and have survived long enough to where they can put more effort, more investment, more energy into single malt. So a distillery that was making one or two casks a year is now making 50 casks a year. So I think that's what we're seeing. Um, a lot of people like to talk about, well, American single malt is having its day now because it, all the whiskey is old enough to be good. I, I reject that. We're not putting out, you know, whiskeys that are, you know, more than a year older than the first time we put out whiskey. So um, I think what's really happening is people are dedicating more time and energy to it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think also it's worth remembering people, you know, people who love whiskey may love whiskey, but in the end, their interest and their loyalty is to brands, not to categories. And, and so the reason I think American single malt has progressed from 
you know, an, an Oregon whiskey or a Colorado whiskey all the way to, to a, a community of, of American single malt whiskey is, is the brand, not just have the products come along, but probably more so the brands and the ability of people making these really great American single malts to connect with people who love whiskey, to build communities around that, that stuff takes time. And, and that's, you know, the, the big disadvantage of the many disadvantages that <laughs> the craft producers have in the U S you know, one that's, that's just, it is what it is, is, is time. Right. It, and it's not time to age the whiskey. It's centuries to have built a brand and built, you know, a community of people who love that brand around the world. Uh, and so we're, you know, we're in the early days of that happening. And, and I think because of that, whatever American single malt looks like, 10 years from now or a hundred years from now will very much be influenced by you know, which brands in the end and, and what products from them resonated with people who love whiskey. Uh, and you know, it really can't be known what that's going to look like. That's what's exciting about it. It's, it's taking right. shape right before our eyes. Um, before we get to uh, this question of the TTB rules and the sort of definition, um, I want to take a, a slightly more, um, let's say, pragmatic approach to the question of, you know, when when you're more a party or TTB, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, when you're at a party or you're doing a you know sales event or whatever, and and someone asks you, American single malt. Well, I like Scottish single. I I thought all single malt was made in Scotland. What is American single malt? Um, you know, what is your what is your answer? How do you explain? This is what Americans. This is what we are making. This is what American single malt is. Yeah, I think that goes to your previous question. Is that that time that Tom was talking about was not just for the distillers, but also for customers to catch up and just to understand. I mean, I hear it still, but I hear it a lot less. It, you can't make single malt only scottish people can make single malt you know um i thought all single malt was from scotland or scotch owns single malt and all this kind of stuff you know i still hear it but i hear it less um i think that you know the way that i tend to answer it is i like to use the japanese whiskey industry as as a reference because a lot of people understand that and have been following that for longer and i simply say look you know the Japanese were the first to prove that great single malt could be out, made outside of Scotland. And now there's countries all over the world uh, proving the same thing. And it's time for America to have a voice. And that's it's it's a simple concept once you get people over the fact that, you know, it bourbon makes it tough because bourbon is a legal, you know, a legal term for Americans, just like, uh, you know, champagne is a legal term for, for that region of France. So I can understand why they think scotch kind of falls in that group, but once you kind of get them out of that and, and point to Japan and point to New Zealand and point to Australia and point to Taiwan and point to India and say, look, there's, there's great single malt being made all over the world. Why not here? And why not now? You know, that's kind of the way I answer it. Yeah, no, I'll add, I mean, for us, we, again, that the, the mythical cocktail party you described, I would never lead with single malt. You know, so what do you do? Like, I don't say I make single malt whiskey because that just goes nowhere. Uh, we, we lead with what Westward is and what we do and why we do it that way. And, you know, that in, eventually leads to, wait, so is it a bourbon? No, it's actually not a bourbon. It's a single malt because it's made from barley, 100%. So, uh, but we've just never really found much success with leading with what is the category. Uh, it's it's better to lead with here's what we do, uh, but the cool thing is we're part of this community of you know now hundreds of producers who and what we have in common is these things which makes us a single mall. Okay, no, that makes, that the, makes the, once you say single so mall, let's, I mean, so let's yeah, dig sorry. in. Good. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. no, no I was just going to say just single mall is. The term single malt carries, you know, some a real meaning beyond the regulatory one for people, and they immediately just go somewhere else. That, uh, that again, over time, it'll acquire the meaning that 
yeah. you know, brands like Westland and Westward and others give it. But for now, it, its meaning is tied to other places and other parts of whiskey history. Yeah, I think we have to acknowledge the reality that the American whiskey consumer is, as much as I hate to say it, is not as educated as what you'd find in Europe. Like Tom was saying, you go to Europe, you say whiskey, they think, they assume you're talking about single malt. They understand what that means. Um, here in this country, people don't know that bourbon's made from corn. You know, people come into our distillery and ask us where we keep the potatoes. You know, and it's, it, it happens all the time. And, you know, it's just, we're, we're still not that far removed from, you know, the late eighties, early nineties where everybody was drinking Cosmos, you know? Um, so I think it just takes time for the American public to kind of catch up. And I think sometimes we tend to forget that because we spend a lot of time talking with whiskey fans that do know what they're talking about. But the, there's a big swath of people in this country that, that just don't have that background and don't have that knowledge. Mm -hmm. They didn't grow up, you know, with their parents giving them drams of single malt, you know, <laughs> over dinner uh, like they do in Europe. So um, it's just like Tom said, it, it takes time and you have to understand that the the, the knowledge base is, is limited to start and you have to start there. Now, if someone says, I know what you're talking about, then you jump into all the stuff that we love to discuss, but you have to, you have to ease into it until you know who you're talking to. Yeah, sure. And, and it, it, it is nevertheless amazing how far things have come uh, in terms of that knowledge base over the last 10 years, even though absolutely right. There is so much, so much, uh, more distance to go. Um, so let's so let's talk about you know this this you know what I think is is an important next step in that, uh, which is getting the TTB to uh, to recognize single malt as a category. And you know I will rather than me try to uh, explain your work, uh, you know let's say you know Steve, can you can you kind of explain what this means and and uh, why this has been a goal of the uh, of the commission for so long? Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, we started the commission in uh, March of 2016 in the midst of a blizzard in Chicago. We all got together um, and we recognized that our far our fortunes were were linked. Right. You know, that that we were selling something that people didn't understand, that didn't have a name um, and a category that isn't that doesn't exist as far as our federal government is concerned. If you look at a, West, a bottle of Westland, it says American single malt on one line and it says whiskey on the next line. The TTB that you've been referencing, the, the government body that's part of the treasury department that oversees what any alcoholic beverage can say on its label, they basically just look at the whiskey part. They're not even seeing the American single malt part because that doesn't exist in their, in their regulations. When we recognized that we needed to have a formal category in order to compete in a pretty, you know, competitive um, whiskey and broader spirits uh, industry. So um, we took it upon ourselves to draft uh, what's called a standard of identity or basically a definition for what American single malt was. Um, we, we fun, it was funny, we set aside, I think, three hours to, to discuss it. We were at Binney's in Chicago um, at one of their in-store bars. And uh, we landed on the definition in about 30 minutes, and we just spent the rest of the time drinking beers and catching up with each other. Uh, but we, we, we all fully went into it thinking that it would be a, a knockdown, drag-out fight over you know what clauses were going to be included. But I think what that story illuminates is that what we're trying to do is not all that complicated, nor is it controversial at all. Um, there are a couple things that are um, conspicuously absent from the Scottish uh, rule book, uh, which we can get into the details of if you're interested. But largely, we're, we're trying to just assure the consumer <laughs> that what they think is in a bottle of single malt whiskey actually is in a bottle of single malt whiskey. So we, we drafted that definition, uh, and again, it's very simple. And luckily for us, at the time, the TTB was engaged in this kind of full-scale review of what's called the Beverage Alcohol Manual, which is, you know, the long litany of rules that are associated with alcoholic beverages in this country. So um, 
you might be saying, well, that was five years ago. <laughs> yes, it was five years ago. And we're still waiting on that final determination. But um, we are now on the official um, spring agenda. And spring is, is an odd term, but they do two agendas per year, legislative agendas. And this is all up treasury. This is not just the TTB's realm. Um, and we are on the list uh, to be published. So they'll publish the rule. Um, we have every confidence that that rule that's published will reflect our definition. Um, we're in constant contact with the TTB. We uh, are in constant contact with uh, ACSA and Discus and other trade organizations that are fully behind us, including the Scotch Whiskey Association, which is interesting. Um, so there's really nobody out there raising a flag and saying, we don't agree with this. Um, it's just really a matter of waiting for the gears of, of democracy to turn. Right? Um, uh, and look, the TTB, they're, they're great people at the TTB. They have an immense task uh, just in their daily work of uh, reviewing every single beer, wine, spirits label that you see on any shelf in this country. They approve about 180,000 labels every year with a very small team that you can probably count on one hand. So it's a monumental task. You know, government moves at a different pace than, the, than certainly the craft distilling world, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, we have every confidence that, that it'll happen soon. I'm actually hopeful that it'll happen this month um, their original schedule was, was December. Um, we didn't quite get there, but, uh, I'm, I, that's the first thing I do every morning is I check my email cause they promised to, uh, to let me know first when, when that's going to be published. So oh. I'm, I'm looking out for it every day. It's, it's imminent. Okay. What happens from uh, there once they well, so it is a, a 90 day comment, public comment period where literally anybody in the world can weigh in on what they think. Um, and, uh, after that, they kind of put a final bow on it and ratify. And so, you know, we could be three and a half months out from having a new category. Wow. Uh, Tom, uh, for, for the audience, um, uh, can you sort of briefly explain what exactly the rule is or what this new, uh, definition is? What is it that you all, uh, are asking the TTB, uh, and hoping the TTB uh, puts into the new manual. Yeah, I, uh, I actually posted the URL for the commission site in the Good. chat if anybody wants to bookmark it. Uh, and I have it here and I'm going to read from it so that I don't embarrass Steve and you know, all my fellow producers, but uh, it, it's, it's really simple and wonderfully inclusive and open for innovation. And it's as simple as this, that an American single malt whiskey is made from 100% malted barley. So you know, the grain uh, distilled entirely at one distillery, thus the single malt, that that could be its own like, discussion. Uh, mashed, distilled and matured in the United States of America, hence the American. Uh, matured in oak casks of a capacity not exceeding 700 liters. That's one of the weirder ones, but you know, oak casks and up to a certain size distilled to no more than 80% alcohol by volume, bottled at 40% uh, alcohol by volume or more. And that's it. Uh, so, I mean, that is, there's a thousand years of innovation that fit within <laughs> just that description. And yet that description protects people who are doing something that, I mean, frankly, is harder and costs more to do uh, from, you know, from someone claiming the use of that name and, and putting a product out there that doesn't comply with, hmm. with all of those. Yeah. Well, and, and so, uh, were there any points of, I mean, Steve, you said this happened really quickly, mm -hmm. uh, and then you went to beers, but were there points of dissent or points of discussion where, uh, cause there, you know, there are a few things in there where I can imagine, you know, cask size, there might've been discussion about uh, distillate, uh, uh, barrel entry proof level. I didn't, Tom, you didn't mention that. And that's a, you know, that's a part of uh, the bourbon rule. I didn't, um, you know, was that something that you considered or didn't leave out? And, uh, you know, we take us behind the scenes a little bit, or maybe everything was 
hunky dory and you guys had a mind meld. Yeah, it was it was pretty hunky dory, I must say. <laughs> um, you know, I so you've got six clauses there. You know, the 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 second three clauses are kind of some nerdy distiller TTB stuff. Um, the first three clauses, I hope, would just be pretty dang obvious to most people that it's got to be made from malted barley. It's got to be uh, made at one distillery that's a single part, and it's got to be made in America. I mean, if if anybody would disagree with those things, they don't understand what single malt means globally. Um, the other three things are really about, you know, it was important for us to put the definition in the parlance of the way the TTB characterizes other whiskeys and other things. You know, we didn't want to go in and say, well, we want you to reinvent your entire language or your entire methodology just to give us something, right? So we had to, we had to fit that in. Now, now, some of those things are about whiskey in this country, and some of those things are about production processes that ensure quality, which is what you'll hear from the Scotch Whiskey Association all the time. Their, their job is to protect the category and to protect the integrity of single malt Scotch whiskey. And, and I would say that our, our, the definition's job is to do that as well here. Um, the only really points of discussion were the things that we left out. I think everybody walked into that room saying, we don't want to stifle innovation. We don't want to limit ourselves. We think the great promise of American single malt whiskey is its ability to innovate. I know Tom agrees with me down at Westward. Certainly it's a big thing for us at Wesson. The last thing we don't, the last thing we want to do is create a replica of Scotch whiskey here. We don't want to make Macallan in Seattle. You know what? We could, we could buy the similar equipment. We could use, we can mimic the processes. We could buy the exact same raw ingredients and we could do, you know, a pretty adequate job of mimicking Scotch whiskey, but that's not really that all that interesting. Innovation is what's interesting and, and what's, what's, unfortunately true is that the scotch whiskey industry has kind of been stuck in its ways for a long time because they've had no real incentive to change because they can't even keep up with demand as it is so good for them but we're sitting out here as brand new distilleries saying well let's put our own spin on on single malt but play within the same general rules so the only two things that were really discussed uh, which are the obvious things that are left out from the scotch definition one is the pot still requirement um, the way the TTB, um, phrases things, you know, our clause about, uh, distillation, uh, limits really, really does what the pot still clause is intended to do in Scotland, right? It, it basically, you can't make vodka on a pot still, um, and the, the, the distillation, uh, ceiling that, that we put in accomplishes the same thing. So we're kind of, we're on the same page there with Scotland. We just have to use different ways and different languages. And there's a tradition here, certainly among craft distillers, you talk about 200 distillers here, you know, there is a lot, you know, even here at Wesson, we use hybrid stills, like they're pots, but they also have columns, you know? Um, so there's, there's a longstanding tradition here outside of single malt and outside of whiskey, even of, you know, different still types. We didn't want to blow that whole thing up and say to every distiller here that you have to use this certain type of still that would that would be untenable from a business standpoint the second thing is a minimum age requirement again i talked a little bit about this before when i was touching on geography you know scotland is a very small area with a very consistent climate um that is not true <laughs> in this country you know and for me to go to my friend jared at balcones who's distilling in waco texas and say you have to put your whiskey in uh, a, a barrel for some amount of time, you know, is kind of an unreasonable thing for him because he has different climate things to contend with than Tom and I do here in the Pacific Northwest. So that's one place, you know, I think it's funny. I don't know, time, time is hard to track in the pandemic, but I want to say it was like nine months ago when the Scotch Whiskey Association said, you can now, you may now use uh, tequila casks. And everybody was like shouting from the rooftops that like, what a breakthrough innovation that is. And all of us here in America, are like we've been using all kinds of different casks for a long time. Um, so again, to have a minimum age requirement is just, is more restrictive and there's not really, uh, there's not a precedent for it at the TTB. Um, and, you know, there's already a definition for straight whiskey. So if you want to do straight bourbon or straight single malt, you can do that. Um, so 
everything that we were trying to do was was create something that had enough teeth to it that that had meaning that protected the consumer at the end of the day but that left room for us to innovate um and that's what it's all about okay um Tom, well, first of all, uh, folks, uh, you know, we're going to keep talking here, but if anyone has questions, uh, we've got one in the Q&A, but ask away. Uh, Tom, do you want to you add anything to that in terms of, you know, your insights on how the conversation went? Uh, I mean, no, for the very specific reason that my partner, Christian, was the one there with Steve and company, so I won't uh, co-opt what happened in the room. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, I know we've, we've talked about that moment and everything that's followed forever. So, uh, I mean, yes, I, I agree with, with what Steve has said. I think, you know, when, when Steve was talking about the, the age requirements, uh, I mean, of course I agree about the importance of giving people flexibility based on their climate, but, but it made me think of perhaps one of the, the areas in which there has been some convergence around, you know, different producers of American single malt in different places. Uh, and it's that we tend to make really robust, really flavorful distillates. And so these are amazing. They've almost barley eau de vies before they ever go into a barrel. Uh, and I think that there's so much of the flavor of our whiskeys in that new make uh, that it, it almost would make you know, longer aging requirements a crime. Because uh, we lose a lot of that great flavor, mm. uh, and so so I think you know when when people ask us, you know what are what what are some of the kind of general stylistic differences between single malts in the U.S. and, and Scotland? Uh, I I do believe we make you know, considerably more flavorful new makes uh, that that then just start their trajectory to maturing in, in a different kind of way. Yeah, certain, I would agree with that, certainly in contrast to a lot of Scotch whiskey distilleries that have had, you know, centuries old, you know, traditions and, and processes in place that are um, that are in place because they anticipate or require longer aging periods. So, you know, for the Scotch Whiskey Association to say, well, we need to put a minimum on there so that, you know, across the board, the the integrity of that spirit is 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 there makes some sense um but again to tom's point not necessarily makes sense here because we've we've been able to break from some of those traditions because we have you know i don't don't mean to wave the american flag here but we do have you know some freedoms that we that we enjoy here you know where we're able to break from traditions and conventions and i think that's resulting in exactly what tom's talking about which is different processes pre-maturation you know that that are, you know, more interesting approaches that that don't rely on on long aging times. So why why impose that on people? Yeah, and I, I, I get this may sound yeah. cynical. I, I I actually have lots of business respect for what I'm about to say. I just don't share it. And it's that the the idea of you know whiskey needs to be 12 years old, or the idea of pricing strategies that are based on how old something is have absolutely nothing to do with quality or character of the whiskey. They have everything to do with keeping people like Steve and me out of this industry because we can't afford to wait that long to sell something. And, mm -hmm. and so, so a lot of the, not just the age requirements, but, but the marketing specifically driven toward convincing consumers that it's all about age. Uh, was was a barrier to entry. Like, well, it existed and, so that there would be less competition. Yeah, I mean, to keep on the cynical train here, um, you know, the people forget history all too quickly. You know, the age statements came about because the Scotch whiskey industry was in trouble. They couldn't sell anything, you know. So one guy down the street in the marketing department said, well, maybe we can sell some of ours if we say it's eight years old. And they got... Oh, shit, sorry. Like maybe that's TTV telling you they just yeah. approved it. Yeah, I wish. No? <laughs> I yeah. don't think they would call my wife first. But um, sorry about that. The uh, you know, so the guy down the street says, "Well, but mine's ten years old." And the guy down the street from him said, "Well, mine's twelve years old." And that's kind of where this age arms race started. And now, now all of a sudden, they're they're all backing away from that. 
you know, it was what, three, four years ago when NAS or non-age statement whiskey started to be the, you know, the, the only way for some of these guys to keep up with demand. And all of a sudden kind of the age kind of took a back seat for a little bit. Now some of them are getting back to it uh, because they've caught up um, and they're kind of in this awkward position where they invested so much for so long in convincing people that older is better. Um, then they weren't able to deliver on it. Now they're like, well, should we go back to it? And there's this kind of, you know, crisis of conscience here, I think, in, in, in a way. So mm -hmm. I think when it comes, we've been saying this word from the beginning, it all comes down to choice, right? There's choices that you can make in the way, the way you uh, mash and distill and mature your whiskey that, that can be designed for older whiskeys or younger whiskeys, and both are valid and both can be great. And guess what? Both can be bad. You know, I've had bad 40 year old whiskeys, you know, um, yeah. so yeah. it's it's all about choices and it's all about kind of the vision that you have for what you want to put in a bottle at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, let's uh, let's take the one at the top first, and this should be a, a shorter one. Uh, but uh, within the rules that, that you laid out, did you have any conversations about uh, adding color, spirit caramel, and how do the rules that you proposed do those do those uh, by your reading exclude those, or are they allowed? How does how does your vision um, comport with that? Because obviously, with with single malt scotch uh, or with scotch generally, you know that's kind of an not very well understood by consumers, but very well understood by distillers uh, ability. Uh, on their part, they can they can add those things. Yeah, I would say there's there's a long list of things that that yeah I, I suppose we discussed, but we quickly recognize we're not in the purview of a trade organization like the commission. You know, we we very much see ourselves in a bit of a different light. We don't we don't envision ourselves as the police of the American single malt category. That's the TTB's job, frankly. Um, so, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to maintain distillers rights to do things the way they saw fit and what was right for them and what their, you know, their production, um, their production kind of rules for themselves and the, you know, and the, and the way they wanted to market their products. So. You know, at Westland, we, we put no, you know, no coloring added, non-chill filtered right on there. That's what we do with our whiskey. But that's not to say that's the only way to do it or the right or the wrong way to do it. That's just the way we prefer. And that's that's a choice that should be left up to the distillers. And there's there's a lot of a lot of aspects to whiskey making that should be left to the distillers and shouldn't be a regulatory thing. Um, again, we wanted that baseline, you know, so that consumers have confidence that and an understanding of what's in the bottle. We didn't want to create this overly restrictive thing that that was more about, again, choice than it was about um, anything else. Okay. Mm. And, and what's really important is so, transparency and, and just being honest with consumers about what each of us does and doesn't do. And it's up to the consumer to decide if they care. Uh, I, I think, sorry, just on a practical note, so many of us use new barrels uh, to mature whiskey that that the color is almost irrelevant. I mean, it, people are amazed. We haven't exhibited our tasting room of what, you know, four week, eight week, 12 week old Westward looks like. You know, and you know, the color comes pretty quickly in does. new oak. So, so there isn't mm -hmm. a whole lot of need for that anyway. But, um, but yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we don't do it, but yeah. if somebody does it and tells everybody and consumers don't care, great. Yeah, Tom brings up an important sure. point, which is kind of a, a separate initiative for the commission outside of the the, the definition and, and the work with the TTB to get that definition in place, which is transparency. And we've developed a, a policy that all of our members subscribe to, uh, which is on the website that Tom shared. So we've all kind of adopted this transparency platform. So it's it's important to us, it has nothing to do with the letter of the law from a from a TTB standpoint, but it's something that that we've all come together to to raise our hand on. All right. Well, we have one more question, and this is a good one to end on. Uh, we have a few more minutes, so maybe you could both uh, you could each tackle this. Uh, you know, let's say tomorrow uh, the TTB 
PB calls and says, uh, we're good. You passed. Uh, <laughs> or even if they don't, <laughs> you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, where do you, where do you want the category to be? Where do you, uh, where do you think it will be? Uh, what's kind of your vision for the medium to long term, uh, at least in craft gear, craft spirit, craft whiskey years? Uh, what's your vision for American single malt? See, the, uh, this whole pandemic Steve, thing had caught... Oh, sorry, go ahead, no, Steve. Go ahead, Tom. I want you to go. No, I was going to say... I want to hear you have to say. I'll draft off. The, <laughs> the experience of the pandemic had made me give up on predicting the future because I've realized that I can't predict <laughs> next week. But but since we got the question, then we need to say something. I, I guess I, I would say... I'll, I'll tell you what my hope is rather than what I think is going to happen because what what all of us work very hard on every day is turning those hopes into reality. Uh, I I know for sure that the day Steve gets that email and TTB approves this category, approximately zero consumers will understand what that means or know what the TTB is. So so that'll be an important foundational element, but but then the work needs to begin. And, and I think the most, to me, one of the biggest opportunities within reach, you know, at that point, if not even sooner, is for you to be able to walk into your favorite liquor store and see a shelf set called American Single Malt Whiskey. And, and to have, you know, a, a physical place or, you know, on the website and, you know, the way things are categorized on the Spirits website. But, but to really have a place where like-minded brands and producers you know, can engage with consumers because, again, just on a very practical note, I mean, the, the McAllen 12 drinker who goes to the Scotch aisle, you know, buys really good whiskey, but you know, they're probably not really into experimenting and they may be 110 years old and neither of those make them, you know, the best consumer for, you know, curious explorer brands like ours. And, and so, and meanwhile, the person who goes to the bourbon shelf, some fraction of them would love what we do, but more of them are looking for something different. So, so just to have a place in the physical world, in a store or in the virtual world, you know, on a, on an online store or in a back bar that is brands like us that have, you know, that share these, I guess have made similar choices to use the word we've been using, uh, I think would be incredibly helpful. And then I'll just throw in, you know, one more hope, you know, when you know, I, I tried to collect some information on just how big the category is now. And, you know, I found something from IWSR that I, I know we're very hard to measure. So I think it understates it by a bit, but you know, by far what they're seeing is, you know, the vast majority of consumption is happening in the U.S. That makes sense as a starting point. Uh, but I would say, you know, based on the experience we've had in other markets and what I gather has been the, the case for Westland from some of the comments Steve has made, you know, I want us to go out there and be everywhere in the world, right? I, I don't I don't want it to just be the the set at the store near my house on the West Coast. Yeah, I want to walk into a store in London or Sydney, Australia or Tokyo and see American single malt whiskeys there next to, you know, some of the legacy brands that we all know from the malt world. Yeah, I'm of the same mind. You know, what do I want to see in 10 years? I want to see, you know, credibility globally. You know, I want to see, you know, a respect and an admiration for the whiskeys that are coming from America and, and stand tall with the finest single malts around, you know, and that you know, Tom brings up a, a really good point that, you know, even the, the TTB designation is important for a number of reasons, most, most specifically to protect the consumer and to protect the category from unscrupulous players trying to use the name uh, without living up to the, to the, the definition of what's in there. Um, but, even if that doesn't happen, you know, this category exists if we all agree that it exists and we all talk about it as such. So I want that, I want that American single malt uh, whiskey shelf in the store. I go into retail stores all the time and say, you really need to have an American single malt shelf in between world malts and scotch. And they say, well, we would, but we just don't have enough. And I said, 
follow me. And I take them by the hand and I walk them around the store and I say, you've got 10 American single malts. The problem is you've got one in bourbon, you've got one in craft, you've got one in other, and then you've got one over by the vodkas. You know, you've got them here, just put them together. I, the same thing happens when I went to a bar. Um, again, time is, is weird right now, but I don't know, a year ago, and they had a Scotch single malt section. They had a Japanese single malt section. They had a Taiwanese single malt section, which had one distillery in it, you know, and <laughs> Westward and Westland, and we're in like the other or the American with a bunch of bourbons, you know? So that that is success to me, you know? I want the competitions to have American single malt categories. I want the industry publications to have review sections that are American single malt because right now we're just lumped into the other. So to me, it's, it's just about the visibility worldwide of a category that, that deserves to be seen and heard. You know, we've, we have at Westland, we've been running this program called the Judgment of Westland Clay. I know you sat in on one, which is where we're blind tasting uh, four different single malts. Um, and people are astonished that they don't pick the scotch out, you know? Um, it's, we're, we're to a point now where there's American single malts that can stand tall with single malts from all over the world. And I think that that respect is what I would hope is, is there in, in five years, 10 years. Yeah. Well, I would agree with that. Uh, Steve, Tom, this has been a lot of fun and, and really enlightening. I hope, uh, I hope everyone here. Uh, in the audience agrees, um, and uh, you know I just really appreciate you taking the time to to join us and to chat. Uh, for everybody else who's out there, uh, you know, go visit beverage.co, and uh, you can get an American Single Malt tasting kit, and also you can find out details about uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have, there is uh, next Wednesday, the nineteenth. There will be a another conversation. This one will be about water water and whiskey and, and everything that goes into into making whiskey uh, from the mashing, the water that's used in mashing up till the water that's used to uh, make a highball. So wow, water and the water of life, uh, it should be a lot of fun. Tune into that. And uh, otherwise, I just want to say thanks to you guys again. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Clay. Thanks, Tom. It was, it was fun. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks for having me. All right. And, yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks to everyone in the audience who tuned in. Everybody have a good night. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.